uh, they are in other events around the world. David managed to go to an event that started a day earlier for some uh, strange uh, thing. Tom is in an event in New York, and I think David has other things <laughs> going on in his life right now. He has a baby, so let's say hi to little Oren. Yeah. And um, <laughs> sorry, it's very important. No, but welcome everybody. This is gonna, it's, it's amazing. Uh, to, to today, uh, this is quote unquote the official event, but there are 600 and... We have a slide from that. We have a slide for that, okay. So there are more <laughs> than 600 events uh, around uh, the world. I am, I don't know how to define this, it's just amazing. But I'm just going to give you a little bit the agenda for the day, and then we can uh, go ahead. So we're going to talk for a couple of minutes just to explain what goes on for about five minutes. Then we have this short presentation between me and Fabio to talk about, you know, this, you know, give some numbers of the size of the Arduino community, some of the things that we are doing, some of the things that Arduino as a company is doing. So just to give a picture of some of the things that have been happening. Then after that, we're going to be announcing the winners of this Arduino Day Community Challenge. So we have some amazing projects from all over the world. But our uh, colleague Xenia is going to do the presentation. You ready? OK, good. Uh, so she's going to introduce the winners. We have a short video of all, this, uh, of the, all the winners. After that, there's a, another talk where I'm going to be talking more about the open source aspects of Arduino. So it's going to be a bit of a nerdy talk. It's going to be about software and open source and all these kind of things. But there's some interesting uh, stuff in the presentation if you're an Arduino fan. Then we have a very interesting talk of the work that we have been doing in the world of IoT uh, with Luca Cipriani, who is in charge of the cloud development for Arduino. And Gianluca Varisco is a chief security officer information security officer. You're not the policeman. You're just the, the, <laughs> the hacker. OK. Ethical hacker, hopefully. OK. And, um, and then, last but not least, uh, Nerea, uh, is, she's going to talk about the work that we're doing in education. And then it's going to be a break. And later on, online, there is this Ask Me Anything, which is going to be a very interesting thing. Um, should we yeah. get started? I think we are on time, so no, <laughs> it's time to... It's shocking. <laughs> A couple of Italians were on time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Boom. So, yeah, so I, we're just going to... I wanted to kick off just by uh, reinstating, in a way, what we try to do as, in, as a community and as a company one of the things that we're very passionate about is the idea that we want to enable anybody to innovate by making complex technology simple to use. And this applies to almost any technology that you can think of. And every time you think you made something very simple to use, there's even more that you can either make simpler, or you can increase the amount of people who have access to, to digital technology that can participate in the world of innovation. This idea that we need to increase the number of people who can participate in innovating with digital technology is incredibly important because there are 7 billion people in the world. We are of all different kinds of people. Literally everybody should be able to take part in the innovation in, in the digital world. Uh, so as I was trying to mention before we don't, <laughs> without the information. Um, so Arduino Day, um, I don't know, I'm, uh, I'm shocked, literally, about the fact that this year we are 659 local events around the world. Hopefully, a lot of you who are awake right now are watching in streaming. Thank you everywhere in the world where you are. We are super excited. 659 local events in 106 different countries, which is, you know... So from, uh, so from this small location, we are connected everywhere in the world uh, with uh, all the events that uh, people are organizing. 
And it's interesting because they span the whole world. So some events might already be done, might already be over, and some events haven't started yet. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing. And so in a way, why are we all getting together? Because at the end of the day, Arduino is the world leading open source hardware and software ecosystem. So it's important for us because we don't do just hardware, we don't do just software. We also do education, we do uh, documentation, uh, we work a lot on the teaching methodologies, we try to build communities, we try to build partnerships, so for us, and also we try to wrap all of that with our, in a way, attention to the user experience. So all of these aspects make this uh, amazing ecosystem and community, and we are very humbled by the fact that we started this thing and, and we are uh, part of it. And um, it's incredible because only last year, uh, the Arduino IDE was download, downloaded more than 28 million times. And uh, there is a natural increase in the number of uh, downloads, but this 120% growth year on year is also due to the fact that we, are, we were also able to uh, serve our ID directly to the community in China, which before, for a number of reasons, were not able to download it directly from our website, so they had to copy it inside China and download it separately. So now, thanks to the help of uh, Gianluca, who kind of figured it out, we, and, and, and uh, with Luca, we, we now able to serve those files also to China, so now we, 28 million in one year, it's staggering. It, uh, it really means that the community of people who actually use Arduino to develop is insanely big. And um, so our online platform, that is our online IDE, but it's also now our online uh, uh, IoT cloud, has reached 863,000 active users, which means that there are many more people registered on this website, but this number is the number of people who use it regularly. So this means that this new way of programming Arduino, which basically requires only a browser, is becoming a very important tool alongside the classic tools that we, that we make. And we know that we have to create different types of tools for different types of audience. And this, is a, this was a big, big project that uh, is, is still growing after uh, many years. And the, another interesting number is the number of people on the Arduino forum. There are, again, 762,000 people that are registered. And this, again, means that they are contributing in some way because there's millions of people who read the information from the forum. But if you're registered, it means that you're posting, you're asking questions, you're helping other people. The number is incredible, and it's a 30% growth year on year. We have forums in a lot of different languages. We have a big group of very um, passionate moderators that help, help us keep things going. The list is very long. Uh, I don't have the chance to thank them individually, but uh, you know, it's just, it's again, it's something amazing for us. And um, so we identified over time that Arduino operates uh, in three main areas. Uh, so there is the classic maker market, uh, where you know, makers use Arduino to learn, to experiment, to try things out. And then we realized that Arduino became very important in education. A lot of different places in the world use Arduino for education, and we then created specific also products and tools for education. And now there's a whole new world of people who are using Arduino to build uh, IoT projects, products, and use Arduino also in their companies in, um, to build actual solutions. And so there's a lot of things that we are doing in the different areas, but uh, I will let Fabio continue. Yeah, thank you very much, And, uh, and uh, I will... Uh, just, uh, just an important piece of uh, what Massimo was saying is uh, that now we understand better who are the users of Arduino, and uh, what we did in the company basically is transforming ourselves to serve those uh, different types of customers with uh, specific uh, tools, with specific... Uh, uh, 
set of information that, uh, that makes uh, Arduino even more relevant for them uh, than it, it was in the past. So one thing that I would like to highlight very quickly, because we, <laughs> we have to do this presentation at 60 frames per second, uh, is that uh, I would, would like just to stop one second to talk about uh, what makes uh, Arduino product special. And of course, Massimo mentioned already that we are trying to make product, you know, uh, accessible to anyone. And in order to do this, there is a continuous attention to the user experience. So we have a group that is quite large in the company of uh, uh, interaction designer, use, uh, UX people, that constantly you know, vet the engineering work and try to make it more human. Because uh, we as engineers, and I include myself in this category, tend to design uh, products for engineers, while the audience of Arduino is made of millions of people that in some cases don't have any degree in engineering uh, or any you know, uh, formal education in engineering. So uh, user experience is important, but it's also important the way we manufacture products uh, when it comes to hardware. And there is a lot of attention that we put in manufacturing products uh, with uh, a lot of uh, ethical uh, you know, uh, mindset, where basically we try to make products that are sustainable. We assemble all the products here in Italy, and uh, we're really proud of doing that because we have uh, hundreds of workers that are working in the Arduino ecosystem to make our products and uh, delivering high quality products to the market. And uh, you, know, you can see and feel the difference with the uh, other type of products that you can find on the market. But uh, it's something that we push quite uh, heavily. We could have moved to produce in other places, but we didn't do that because we are happy on delivering high quality and high values also on the manufacturing point of view. The other aspect that people sometimes don't understand is how critical is security for IoT. And uh, we spent a lot of uh, time and money in engineering uh, to try to embed security as much as we can in our product. So the Arduino connected product may look a little bit more expensive, but they are uh, more expensive for one reason. One is that we take security seriously, and the other thing is that we take communication seriously. So also from the communication point of view, we use top-notch uh, communication modules, the best among the best available on the market, and we embed those modules in our product. The other thing, we spend a lot of energy and time and brain relate, uh, for topics related to the certification of the products. So it's not easy uh, to find uh, high quality certified products in this, uh, in this space, and this is what we uh, try to push on the market. And also, we reorganize completely our customer support in order to support the needs of uh, our customers. So one important point that I would like to highlight is also the fact that we try to deliver, to make it, our products accessible in every corner of the earth, and to do that, we are relying on a network of distributors that reach now more or less 300 uh, distributors and resellers that are active in 94 countries. Uh, you see some names here are some of the largest distributors that, uh, that, that we have because I could not list all of them, but we are really happy about working with uh, uh, our partners that are also allowing us to to distribute our product and to make them available in places where things can be complicated. The other big effort that we did internally in the company is also to allow people to get Arduino as fast as possible. So we did a big effort in uh, uh, delivering Arduino products uh, on Amazon. We just released a, a flagship store on Amazon for the product, but also renewed and redesigned completely the store.arduino.cc. And you can imagine the complexity of you know, changing uh, something important that serves millions of, uh, of customers. So I strongly encourage you to, to visit the arduino.cc site and, uh, and look at, at those innovations. So as far as innovation, uh, 2018 has been a year where we invested a lot of resources, not only on the hardware side, and on the modernization of the company and the ecosystem, and you will see the results of this modernization uh, in, the, in, the, in the next uh, weeks and months. Uh, but we did a lot of work also as far as the software is concerned. And the biggest innovation that we delivered is the Arduino IoT Cloud. And I strongly encourage you to go uh, after this session, uh, session with, uh, with Luca and Gianluca about the IoT Cloud, because they will show you hands-on what we have done. Basically, the idea is to create something that is easy to use and deploy. Uh, so with a wizard-based approach where people can just connect a device securely on the cloud 
uh, in a few minutes. Uh, security is a param of paramount importance for us, so what we try to do is to hide the complexity of security behind the curtains so that the, we code generate the code, the boilerplate code that solves all the security problems. And uh, what we have done also, Massimo was pushing quite uh, heavily on that, is to create an open protocol that can be used uh, to simplify you know, the interfacing with, uh, with the IoT nodes in a bi-directional way, so you can, we de you can define properties and those properties are automatically uh, translated from the cloud to the device, but you will see the demonstration. As, as you know, the cloud, uh, the connecting devices is quite complex because there are multiple layers and actors. There are IoT nodes, edge, there is the cloud with different types of communication, GSM networks, narrowband IoT, LoRa, Sigfox. So what we try to, to do in this area is to be very inclusive and also work on the cloud side to make this simple, to connect those devices, but also to interface with third-party clouds. So in terms of core capabilities as of today, uh, we have the firmware de development and code generation with Create. We have the secure device provisioning and management that allows you in a few minutes to get a device securely provisioned. We uh, allow people to do dashboard development so that they can create control panels for their systems and also interface with third-party uh, cloud. This is an example of a dashboard. In the demo, you will see, will see more. But at the basis of everything, we, we should remember that we are a hardware company and uh, at the roots. So we uh, are keeping pushing quite uh, hard on this concept of uh, the MKR, that is a new small form factor that introduced uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, where we try to combine in a single device everything you need to create an IoT node. Uh, so there is a microcontroller, uh, there is a secure crypto element for secure communication, there is uh, battery charging for power uh, management that is fairly complicated and also important, and also different types of communication. And we try to support every type of communication that makes sense today, ranging from Wi-Fi, to uh, Sigfox LoRa, uh, GSM to G3G, and also uh, LTE, narrowband IoT and CATM1, Wi-Fi, BLE, and uh, also the latest uh, product that we introduced was the uh, FPGA uh, that uh, you can also go <laughs> and, and discover more about this because this is a very, uh, very important uh, enhancement. As you can see, uh, most of the products have this multi-core architecture. That uh, is something that is very important because it's a choice where, again, people may think that we just increase the price of the board for no meaning because, you know, some of the modules may have the capability, but what we try to do is basically to allow a bigger compatibility with the libraries and also a better use of the power that is allowed by this multi-core uh, multi architecture. Uh, as part of this strategy, we are not only developing boards, but we have a number of shields like in the ecosystem, and a number of shields are coming on the market from partners that are working uh, in isolation and also with us, where we have some shields that are more tailored to the makers and to hobbyists, but we also have some shields uh, for more professional application, like the CAN shield to interface with CAN. Another accessory for the MKR board are the uh, carriers, carrier boards, where basically you have more space and uh, they are used to interface for more complex things, like the motor carrier. It's a very advanced motor control uh, device that we use also in our, in our kit. There is also an important update that we did last year to the, to the uh, traditional Arduino form factor, that is the Uno Wi-Fi Rev2. Basically, we share the same module that you saw in the previous products, and uh, it has a much, much more powerful microcontroller. It's 8-bit, but has more RAM and flash, so people can use it to do much more complicated stuff, and uh, it's, a very, it's a very complete product. It's a very, uh, you know, enhancement over uh, the traditional products. Uh, we also introduced a gateway. Our first product in uh, the gateway space is a LoRa gateway, where what we try to do with, uh, with the help of uh, a company, an Italian company called Ambit, that is specializing in uh, uh, radio, uh, radio modules. We have the CEO of the company here in the room. Uh, it was basically to put in the hands of Maker a really professional uh, LoRa gateway with features that people normally you know, uh, don't know they exist, like listen before you talk, multiple channels. So this is a professional gateway packaged in the format where 
the maker can assemble and play with it and uh, uh, very powerful for a lot of application. This is just an example of what people can do uh, with, uh, um, with, our, uh, with our solution. And uh, this is a company, uh, it's a multinational company that makes components for tractors and they standardize on uh, our MKR family of products to equip the tractors with uh, connectivity capabilities and uh, interfacing with the CAN bus information from the tractor and sending, it, and sending them to the cloud. Those are type of, this, this is a type of uh, customers that are non-conventional customers, customers that normally uh, do something very well in their field, but then with Arduino they can open up other possibility with, uh, with, uh, with uh, IoT. So Massimo, education. We are working quite heavily in education. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay, so quickly, I don't wanna uh, you know, Nerea later will explain to you this much better than I can do, but let's try. You know. So we have been working on a number of uh, ways to expand the reach of the work we do in education. For now, we mostly work with uh, kids that were in high school or older. So we just announced this January. This is the uh, science kit, this is the Arduino science kit, which we developed in uh, collaboration with uh, um, Google. And the idea here is that this, uh, this board, this kit, allows uh, to do a number of experiments in physics and use a smartphone or a tablet as the interface where you interact with the data, which is very relevant, in my opinion, for kids, because a lot of kids right now have phones of different kind, so it's a much more natural interface for them. And so, yeah, so the idea is really expanding the age range, go working with younger and younger kids, uh, pushing this approach that we have of hands-on, project-based learning, so kind of the opposite of the full frontal lecture, kind of, you know, a, a, different, a different model. And there's a lot of work done in, in, in training, doing partnership, working with teachers. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to help teachers, in a way, understand different ways of, uh, of teaching these kind of uh, topics. And so this is kind of a graph showing that, you know, we have different packages for different ages. So we have this project called CTC that we have been delivering for now a few years. And we have a new version called CTC Go, which is much more modular, more sort of, uh, it's kind of the newest iteration of the project. And we also have this uh, engineering kit is a product that we've been doing for a bit with MathWorks, so it's more for our university students. But we have new certification programs. Like, interestingly enough, in a lot of different parts of the world, people really want to be officially certified as Arduino uh, users, in a way, or experts in Arduino, so we developed this certification program. So actually, we, you know, we don't mention it that, that much, I guess, but there's a whole office in Malmo, Sweden, uh, where Nerea works, uh, that is dedicated completely to uh, education, where my co-founder, David Quartieres, leads, you know, is the CTO of the education group. So they keep coming up with different, um, different uh, things. So they, to kind of develop the, the number of things we do and they expand the age range of what we do. Uh, this is uh, another picture of all the different parts of the physics kit. The idea is that there are a bunch of projects that are themed like a in a lunar park. So each one of the experiments is a lunar park ride, and they teach you a bunch of things about physics. This board has a bunch of sensors on it. It uses Bluetooth to talk to the phone. This, uh, it took a lot of work. The, um, our colleague Valentina Kinnici worked on it for now more than, a, I guess, a year, more or less. And um, it's a, I think it's a very interesting project because, again, it interfaces with a device that a bunch of kids in certain parts of the world, let's say the richest part of the world, kids have smartphones, and so they are much more naturally interacting with that device than with conventional computers. So I think this is going to be a very interesting project. And as usual, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on providing guides for teachers. So explaining teachers how we teach so they can use the methodology. This is a, um, I think there was, this there was, was a, video. a video, but it didn't translate very well. But the idea is that this is a swing. So the board swings back and forth. 
and there is a there is an accelerometer gy gyroscope on this board that detects the information and sends it to the phone so that you can understand the kind of forces that are involved when an object kind of swings back and forth. So it's the classic pendulum uh, type uh, physics experiment. This is a picture of the CTC Go. You can see there is this very interesting construction system that uh, is modular. Uh, kids built uh, uh, a lot of different uh, projects. The, again, there's, um, we have always have an online part, so there's an online platform and a physical kit, and uh, again, teachers training. But um, I guess the idea, again, is that you build a number of projects, and as you build this project, you acquire a different part of uh, the kind of the curriculum that, that we teach. So we try to uh, put the emphasis on learning by making and building things, as opposed to starting with the theory and then maybe applying it later. I mentioned the certification a little bit uh, before. Um, it's, I think it's interesting. There's a lot of people that basically want uh, an official certificate that says you know at least the basics of Arduino, and this is going to be very interesting for them. Uh, announcements. Yes. Are, <laughs> Do I do, I do, okay, I'm doing the announcements. Ta-da, so we have some new uh, shields. So we're building a bunch of these modules that go on top of the MKR boards. Um, uh, so we have one with the, it's a GPS shield so that you can track the position. This one allows you to connect to therm uh, thermocouples so that you can measure temperature in ovens and uh, so you can use it to, you know, to bake ceramics, but also to bake bread. That depends on, uh, you know, what you, what you want to do. This one is super fun. It's an, it's a group. It's a matrix of RGB LEDs that you can control and you can draw things on. It's, it's super fun, and very bright. So don't stare at it while it's on. <laughs> and um, and this one is an interesting uh, shield. It has a bunch of environmental sensors on it, so it can measure temperature, humidity. Uh, brightness and a bunch of other environmental uh, parameters. So you can build, uh, just by putting this on top of an MKR board, you build an environmental uh, sort of uh, station no? uh, to monitor the environment around the board. So I just wanted- This was a video as well. <laughs> this was also a video. Uh, so the sneak peek didn't work. So no sneak peek, but don't worry about it. It's okay. So we are also, you know, remember the, a while ago, we were talking about the tools that we are building for our FPGA project. So there was a video here showing how the tool is coming along. But uh, since we, the video doesn't work, it's even better because it, the mystery continues. <laughs> and we don't, uh, you know, so you're like now on the edge of your seats trying to figure out what, what is it going to be? So, yeah, so, you know, that's a wrap for the sort of introductory sec session. Yeah. So just uh, just uh, a few a few remarks. Uh, you saw a slide where we were talking about makers, education, and business. The important thing is that we are putting a lot of energy uh, to try to serve better each of uh, those groups. Uh, so what you should expect uh, in the upcoming months is innovation in the in all the three areas. So we're not forgetting about makers just because we put Arduino on tractors. Uh, by no means. Now we are uh, creating a lot of innovation to, to create affordable technology for, uh, mm -hmm. for makers, putting them in a situation where they can leverage, uh, you know, very powerful technology at the, at the right price point. Yeah. Uh, in the future, we are working with uh, the business side, uh, with a dedicated team, uh, that is basically listening to their needs, like the longevity of products, certain types of certification, certain type of enclosure, and so on and so forth. And also in education, as Massimo mentioned, uh, our focus is not only to provide the elementary building blocks, but also to provide structured, uh, a structured approach for, for the classroom or for groups of students. And uh, you will see in, uh, in the vertical presentation about education, how this thing is, uh, is really uh, appreciated by students. Uh, we did it now, the CTC that you mentioned before, has yes. been done by uh, tens of thousands of students. And okay. it's amazing how creative they can be. And even, I, I think, here in this, in this event, 
if, if you move to the other room, there is, you know, a ton of genius baby that are just uh, hacking with Arduino and robots and, uh, and creating crazy, crazy stuff. So what we want to do is to allow teachers to, to feel more comfortable in, <laughs> in, in dealing with technology with Arduino. So we are kind of coupling the hardware physical aspect, so the kit and the boards, with uh, the uh, classroom material on the e-learning platform. It's a lot of effort that requires design, that requires you know, uh, a lot of studies and a lot of interaction with teachers worldwide. And also there we uh, established a quite uh, important network of specialized partners in education that allow us to, uh, you know, to make also the educational products available with the complex mechanism of the educational uh, stuff. Last mention, and I think we are out of time now, is, uh, is to the fact that some of the cloud products that we have are also available for schools. And uh, so schools can leverage create on, uh, on Chromebooks. And uh, this is also something that uh, is going to be very important moving forward because this gives people the ability to leverage a cloud experience also for, uh, for students. Cool. So, Thank you very much. When you said vertical presentation, I thought you were going to rotate the screen. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, so for the next segment, we are introducing our colleague, Senia. Please come to the stage. She's going to present the next okay. segment. Uh, do you have a microphone? Yes. yes. Ah, okay. okay. So good. So. I'm go we're going to remove ourselves yes. from the... Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Massimo. Thanks, Fabio. Hi, everyone. I'm Xenia. And it's a big honor for me to be here and announce the winners of uh, Arduino Community Challenge. First of all, I would like to thank all the people participating in this channel, uh, in this challenge all over the world. We received 123 applications, so a huge applause to all the people participating. <laughs> So the highest uh, number of applications we received from Asia region, region, so we received 47 applications. So thanks guys for your participation. And so let's move forward to the winners of different categ categories. And the first category is uh, audio and visual arts. And the winner is <laughs> the project called Drum Cube by Franco Molina. And applause. Hi, my name is Franco Molina from Santiago de Chile. I am the winner of the Arduino Challenge in the category of Audio and Visual Arts. And this is my project. It is called the Drum Cube. It is a portable robot drummer and it can play music with you. It improves the world of music music by bringing a musician which is not human, is not a recording, nor a digital virtual instrument. It is something you can see, touch and feel, as well as hear. It works, it works with an Arduino Uno. It controls three different servos, which move these wooden sticks to hit this can and two little piezos in here and in here and in here. The Arduino also controls a transistor white noise generator, which acts like a drum hi-hat. You can program it with different rhythms and, ch and change the pattern of a song with an external switch foot. This project took me almost a year to complete, so I'm very pleased with this award. Thank you, thank you very much from Chile. Muchas gracias. Grazie mille. Thank you, Franco. So the next uh, category is uh, environment and space. And the winner is the project called Intelligent Irritation System by Ahmad Radi. Let's have a look. Hi, my name is Radi. Uh, I live in Bandung, in Indonesia. Uh, my project is Intelligent Irrigation System and Water and Soil quality monitoring based internet of things and data science in agriculture. I create this project by uh, Arduino, Arduino Mega and some of uh, 
humidity sensor of soil and this is for temperature of, of soil and this is uh, air humidity and air temperature, temperature for uh, weather measurement and this is uh, raspberry P for uh, MQTT gateway hey. Okay, uh, the next category is uh, home automation and this category is sponsored by our distributor uh, Mauser. So, uh, the winner in this category is uh, Andreas Cavuzzo. Let's have a look. Applause. <laughs> Hello. Hello, this is Andreas Cavuzzo from Palermo, Italy. I'm an electronic engineer and I started to use Arduino since 2013. So the main idea of this project is to create a low, very low cost home automation system um, based on Arduino. So the user can uh, buy the Arduino, some sensor and con connect them using the application on the, on the mobile phone. The name of application is Arduino. Arduino means Arduino made by, by me, by Andrea. This is the project. This is a, an example of, of Arduino. This is an Ethernet shield. This is Arduino Mega. In this case, I connected it to internet using a cable to the modem. I connected also a relay board. In this case, this is a simple relay in which you, we have four relay. Another important point is the possibility to see on the application of the sensor. So all the connected sensor on the Arduino can be displayed here. And also uh, and another point is the possibility to, to connect uh, all the board uh, using the Wi-Fi connection. Okay, thank you everybody. Bye bye. Congratulations, congratulations to Andrea. So uh, the next category is kids and education. And uh, the winner in this category is the project called Our View of Smart Living by Davor Sijanovic. Applause. Hello to everyone. We're an Arduino school project team from Vukovar, Croatia. My name is Davor. This is Marko, Matko, Sanja, Matija, Pia and Ivan. By working on a project using genuine Arduinos, we came up with an idea of making a model of our hometown bookmark, where we can present some of our, our, our ideas about the infrastructure a smart city should have. This project we name our view of smart living. This model uses the genuine Arduino boards, 3 and higher, higher 1000 and 1 Arduino Uno. We competed in the education category and we believe it made a positive impact on problem solving and proper programming which would enhance developing the specific computer way of thinking in classroom environments. This magnificent model offers a solution, greater electricity saving, better use of solar sun powered panels and reducing traffic jams on the roads as well as around parking lots. Our motto is we provide a solution to less pollution. Great. So uh, let's move forward to the next category and it's called robotics and it's sponsored by our distributor Distrelec. So the winner in the category robotics is a project called Robot Sane, Robot Safe by Desaploic. Let's have a look. Hi, I'm called Desaploic I am the team education ambassador in Cameroon. I am from Cameroon. Today we are celebrating the 
Adreno Day 2019, in which I'm glad to present my project Robot Safe, which is a deployment of an exploratory robot called Desbot for the agricultural purposes for the collection of data. The robot is being based on Adreno Maker. Voilà. And the positive impact of this robot is to enable easy acquisition of data of the, of the agricultural uh, environment. Also enable more reliable monitoring and management of the agricultural environment. Also for the production of climate change. Thank you very much. Awesome, and now we're moving to the next category and I would like to invite to the stage uh, Andy from our distributor uh, Farnell Element 14. Please Andy, welcome on stage. Oh. Thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be here at Arduino Day. Um, so I'm from Farnell Element 14 and we have sponsored the small scale Manufacturing and Startups Award. I'd just like to very quickly thank Arduino uh, for very kindly inviting us to sponsor it. It's great to be part of such a fantastic challenge. So without further ado, uh, announcing the winner of the Small Scale Manufacturing and Startups Award is Exide by Microside Technology. I'm Jesus Cortez, the CEO of Microsite Technology, a Mexican startup company located in Tlaxcala City. I present you the Excite project. It's a hardware kit based, based on one main programmer module, the XU, and 20 breakout complement boards that can be used as four microcontrollers platforms, Arduino, Pinguino, Mi Microchip Picks, and Admel ABRs. Three breakout complement boards can be used as Arduino Uno, Nano, and Mega. The main feature of Excite is that we took, we took off 50% of the components and we emulated into the XU. In this way, we can save time, energy, and resources to, to make the boards. And at the same time, we are taking care of the environment. Right now, we have two assembling lines and we are producing the Excite in our city. In this way, we are helping to local students and makers create new IoT projects. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And so the last but not the least category is called social innovation and it's sponsored by our distributor Arrow. And the winner is the project called Escognabot by Angel Villanueva Martinez. Applause. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Angel Villanueva and I'm from Barcelona, Spain. It's my pleasure to show you my project, project which has as its main character the Sconable Robot, an open software hardware project that aims to bring robotics and programming to children. In this particular case, to bring, to bring children or children with any kind of visual impairment. The final goal of this project is to help those children to use the Sconable Robot and to use robotics as a lead tool. Thanks for watching. Thanks a lot. So once again, congratulations to the winners and a big, big thanks to everyone who participated in this challenge. You guys rock. Applause. <laughs>
And actually, we release a ton of open source code, and not everybody understands the amount of work that we do also on some very significant piece of code. So we actually sometimes spend a long time crafting bits of code uh, that actually, in my opinion, contribute quite a lot to the community. And sometimes that part, you know, people are used to using the classic Arduino, they don't understand. So this is going to be a bit about that. Um, so if you look at uh, our uh, GitHub repository, there are hundreds of public repositories that you can uh, access and get code from. And um, the idea is that you know, we cook all this source code and we serve it. And, uh, and we have uh, a lot of internal developers, but you also have, lucky enough, that there's a large community of people around the world that help us as well. So let's touch some of the, the stuff, the, some, of the, some of the code that I'm talking about. So I think one of the most uh, interesting examples is this uh, Java IDE, which is what a lot of the people used to program their Arduino. But actually, in the last few years, we have done quite a lot of work to open up the IDE so that you can actually install software that you can use for boards that are not official Arduino products, but products made by other people. And we are very happy that we can participate in this ecosystem and help other people uh, take advantage. Also because I don't think it makes any sense for us to be doing the same thing multiple times. So we're trying to be even more open. So if there are ways that we can be more open, you know, please uh, let us know. But so last night, our uh, fantastic team, Christian, Maglie, Martino, and all the other team released the new version of the IDE, which is a number of interesting features. Uh, some of the features were so esoteric that when I read, OK, when was that thing? Like uh, uh, the one about the compilation, the, the, disc, the definition was incredibly fancy. Now, there were some words that I didn't know what they meant, so it must have been a very serious uh, type of uh, piece of code. So, but the general idea is that, as I mentioned, there was only there was 30 million downloads only last year. So you have to imagine that 30 million means that the community of people that are actively you the vodka is uh, there are uh, actively using. Uh, if you are somebody who moves his hands a lot when he's, and then you have water, it's not a good idea. So I'll put it here, so I can kick it later by accident. And so the, so the general idea is that this has become a tool that a lot of people use, even with uh, products that are not Arduino products. And this is when I talk about, about being part of a big ecosystem and leaving room for a bunch of different uh, groups, companies, enthusiasts, open source groups to kind of work together on the same tools. And uh, it has na almost 9,000 stars on GitHub. This is a very nerdy measurement, but it means that there's a lot of high level kind of nerds who like the code that uh, uh, we wrote. And this is based on the processing project, which is uh, a tool that we you know, love and gave a lot of inspiration to Arduino. So this is a nerdy statistics. We will publish the numbers. So basically, when you install a library in Arduino, and libraries are very important. They're a huge ecosystem. People write Arduino libraries to interface sensors, interface protocols, add feature to the language. And they are very, very important. So for example, our IDE has 2,000 more than 2,000 uh, available from inside the IDE. But we made an estimation that if you look at all the different types of bits of code that are available for Arduino, we're more, there's kind of more than 7,000 in the wild. Some people have been asking lately which ones are the ones that people download the most. This is not necessarily an indication of how much they are used, but at least it's how they are um, downloaded. This is something that we asked ourselves a lot. We wanted to do this in a way that didn't infringe on anybody's privacy. So, you know, Luke at the team did a lot of work to basically extract the information, keep it the privacy of users as much as possible, because we don't want to, 
we're kind of, we don't want to profile anybody. We don't want to know what you eat for breakfast. We just want to, you know, we just want to work together on, uh, on Arduino and that's it. So there are some interesting, you realize there's a lot of different bits of code that people use to interface with different things, like, you know, to build a, infrared remotes or, for example, you know, Firmata is very popular. This is for LCD graphs. There's some other Adafruit. Adafruit has a lot of libraries they write uh, that help people a lot. So there's a lot of their libraries in here. So I will publish this number uh, later on in the next few days so that people can start having a look. But I think it's interesting to see the diversity of projects that people do using all these different, uh, different libraries. And um, so these numbers are from the beginning of January. So we haven't, we started tracking this information only from now. So the other thing that is quite interesting is that you can actually run Arduino on a bunch of different hardware. So the ones on, in blue on the left, these are the ones that we write or maintain. So one of the things that maybe a lot of people don't realize is that you can actually write Arduino code and run it on Linux as an application. You can do it on Intel and, uh, and ARM. So this is something that you can actually do now. It's available for free. And, uh, and I think it's, it, it makes, in a way, if you have skills in Arduino and you have, for example, a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone or even a big Intel Edge uh, machine, you can program it with Arduino so you can transfer your Arduino skills. And a bunch of companies around the world, including, you know, this is Sony, this is Microsoft, this is STM, you know, I don't wanna, uh, this is Realtek, that's STM. So a bunch of different companies have ported Arduino to their platform. So this allows people to take a piece of Arduino code and by changing just a few lines of code, running on a different piece of hardware. So the, the part in yellow is the work of the community. And I've only stopped because I've kind of ran out of screen space, but there's, kind of, there's, there's a lot more. There's a lot more. So one of the things that uh, also I want to um, highlight is the fact that in order to make the software development more, um, more, more, more open to people, we develop a bunch of different modules that allow people to use what our development environment does in their own environment, in their own software, in their own services. So for example, these tools here, the preprocessor, the builder, and the command line interface. These are projects that we built in the last two, three years. They basically break out the intelligence that is embedded in the Arduino development environment into tools that you can embed in your own projects. And actually, some people are using it already in their own, uh, in alternative development environments for Arduino. So all these are names of GitHub repositories, so you can go to GitHub and find them. There is a lot of work in those piece of code because when you press the button on a, and you want to compile a piece of Arduino code, since we want the code to be very simple to users, the development environment, the IDE, has to make a lot of work to understand how to turn that into a piece of valid C++ code. So there's a lot of intelligence that goes on in this module to make that happen. The same thing happens with the online IDE. We created a bunch of modules that are used in our online IDE that you can actually use in your own projects. So I advise you to go out and check. But for example, this software is the one that allows uh, when you're using the online IDE create, which runs inside the browser, in order for that to talk to your uh, hardware. This piece of code makes that happen on any type of operating system. Or these are things that we use when we want to manage Linux machines remotely. So these are all bits of code that we make available that people are using or you can use in your own uh, projects. So this is the the peak of nerdiness in this uh, presentation because I'm trying to highlight the fact that we just released this uh, IoT platform that allows people to build Internet of Things applications that are secure from the get-go. So they are born secure. 
And to do that, we had to develop a bunch of different code. This is, you know, the number of people internally who worked on this is too long to mention. But um, uh, the idea is that we built different libraries to manage, to manage the power inside the processor so you can make it easy to run your hardware on batteries. This is very important. All of our new boards have this encryption chip on board that make it very secure for the hardware to connect to the cloud. So this allows people to build secure projects from the start, so without adding security afterwards. Unfortunately, a lot of tutorials, code, platforms that you find online, they basically say, well, let's build this thing, and then later on, let's figure out the security, which is the wrong approach. So we're trying to say, let's start from a secure approach, and so we use a hardware chip to do that. And then we even had to take a, and build our own SSL uh, stack to do the encryption, to be able to take advantage of that chip. And we built a bunch of modules. And also, on your browser, when you want to communicate with the device, we developed another module that makes it easy to create a communication between the device and the browser. So the general idea is there's a bunch of co code that powers our cloud. But if you take these bricks, imagine them as some kind of a Lego brick, and you put them together, you can actually very quickly build your own secure IoT solution, even without using our, I know, my CEO will, no, but it's important. <laughs> now, you can build it yourself using these modules that we give to people. So you can use an MQTT server here and build your own thing. So, and this is very important for me that the underlying protocols are open, documented, open source, that anybody can use them because the more people use this, it impacts and benefits all of us. One little mention, this, this, um, this module here called Arduino Core API is something that in the presentation I made in the last few years I called a chainsaw project. And this allows the people who port Arduino on different processors to have a starting point which contains probably, what, 40%, 40% of the code already there so that we don't have to waste time all doing the same thing because you imagine all the people in this slide are all doing the same thing. They're basically replicating those 40% of code. So if we all use that little thing here, we can save 40% of the work, get a better code, and work together more. So we are trying to build more and more of these tools. And also, all of these IoT products that we keep talking about, they're all open source. If you go to our website, you can download the files, you can go make them yourself, you can, you know, we think you should buy them from us, but you know, we want to foster innovation and enable people uh, by providing all of the files for this. And each one of these contains a piece of code, which again, seems like a little, you know, it's got a very short six letter name, but there is a ton of work and sweat and swear words as well in the, in the, <laughs> Vero Christian, uh, in the project. <laughs> and also violent, yes, uh, in the project, because each one of these enable you to use these very powerful modules. But again, if you have your own hardware, which is using a U-Blox, Sara, or Nina hardware, you can use our code and build your own solution. So again, we're making this tool available for people, and hopefully we can work together uh, to make them better. And I'm not even touching the amount of work that the team is doing on the FPGA stuff because it's, again, way too complicated for me to understand, but there's a lot of stuff there. So yeah, what I'm trying to say here is that we make all this available. A lot of people don't understand that all this stuff is available. They see Arduino kind of, you know, for, uh, as the classic kind of Arduino, but there is a ton of work there that we make available because we want people to use it. We want people to work with us on it. Um, so to highlight the importance of open source for Arduino, I have a small announcement that I'm very proud, let's say, proud about, um, which in open source, 
you have to help each other. So on our packaging, you can see that we say open source is love. No? So open source is love because in the moment you take hours and hours of your work and you make it available for free to anybody, that's love. You love other people. You want them to work with you. No? So there's an element of love. Although it's nerdy love, it's still love for other human beings. And it's, but a lot of open source projects, they basically don't have a business model that allows them to get money to support themselves. And I think it's very important for the projects that have a way to make money by selling hardware, for example, that we help each other. In the past, we've done it already. Then we had to pause for a number of reasons that are too long to explain. But basically, we have decided that starting from this year, we're going to be donating $50,000 to the open source projects that we benefit from. So we're going to do this. Um, there's going to be a detailed blog post coming out uh, very soon. But the general idea is that we're going to be selecting a number of projects because they are clearly benefiting us, and we take their work, and we want to give money back to them. So roughly half of this uh, $50,000 will go to uh, open source projects and the entities that support them, say, Free Software Foundation, for example. And the other half, we're going to be asking the community to tell us which, 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 uh, which projects, which open source projects they think we should be supporting. And I think, you know, this, I think it's very important because, again, open source works if we all work together, if we all help each other, but it also works if you try to give back. You, we give back sometimes by fixing code, fixing bugs, and all of that, but we wanted to do more. I'm very happy that we were able to do this, and I think it's, uh, for me, it's a very nice way to end this presentation. Uh, you know, and I'm, I, I hope that more and more people follow our example uh, because otherwise it just does, we are so reliant on open source software and hardware in our lives, but sometimes we don't realize because there's so many, have you seen all these little blocks in some open source projects that you're using? In your, if you have an Android phone, there's a lot of Linux in it. There's hundreds of people that develop Linux. There's a lot of different modules. And so we have to support each other, either by doing work or also by donating money. And we're, we're starting. Thank you very much. So, Ben, thank you. Uh, thanks for advancing the slide. So I think the next presentation is Luca Cipriani. Are you mic'd? Are you ready? Come to the stage. Don't be shy. Do you want a sip of vodka? <laughs> it no, is thanks. actually water, just to clarify. Thank and you, also, everyone. Uh, oh. No, let me introduce them together. Sure. So Luca Cipriani, who heads the cloud backend development in Arduino, does a lot of things. We met at the coffee machine. Yeah, a couple of years ago. A <laughs> couple of years ago. And I said, maybe one day you will work you will, with us. And it was true. There actually. you go. So hang out at coffee machines if you can. <laughs> Gianluca Varisco, who is an internet superstar and expert in uh, security. Uh, there's way too many things to say about yeah. your, uh, okay. so I'm not going to say anything. That's okay. <laughs> Apart from the fact that you are the chief information security officer, the two of them are going to be talking about the work that we're doing on IoT. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Do everyone. It. So, thanks, thanks for that. This is something we started thinking about really many, many years ago. Um, and a lot of also competitors starting thinking and developing uh, ecosystems around IoT. But obviously, the history of Arduino is all about uh, making things effective for users. So it doesn't really always make sense to add feature and more feature to something that already exists. but we want to make it available for everyone. So what we figure out is that it was, and still, it, it's not easy to develop on your own 
an IoT application that is secure, reliable, and fast to implement. It's really a hard problem. Uh, we tried by ourselves, so using other clouds, uh, you have to look around the documentation. It's usually very complex. Most of the time, maybe you are a web developer that doesn't know the hardware so well, uh, or the other way around. Uh, so you know the hardware very well, but you are not an uh, internet expert. Obviously, in, in, the world, in the world IoT, there is internet a thing. So it, it's really hard to be expert um, in both worlds. So we try to simplify all of this. And more in general, uh, the IoT is made by hardware, software, and data. And the hardware, obviously, you know, the world is made now by electronics. We have it in our pockets. We have it everywhere. I'm using a microphone. Those are the slides running on physical hardware. So it's really a huge ecosystem, and it's very hard to program in generally. Obviously, if you don't use Arduino or similar tools. So you have to you know C, C++, even more exotic uh, programming languages. Um, you usually have, for doing IoT, gateways in the middle. Um, so you know, the hardware complexity is really hard to manage. And then there is the cloud, the I in IoT. The cloud, as it is, is you know, it can mean a lot of different things because there are really many different languages, many different protocols, HTTP, Co-op, MQTT, whatever it is. Uh, a lot of different libraries in Java, JavaScript, Python, uh, C, C++. It's, it's, everything is extremely complex. This is a, a programming language. This is named BrainFuck programming language <laughs> and it's actually executing real code. You know, the, the programming languages can really be uh, very hard to understand for people. And then there is the last, but also most important part of IoT, that is made by data. Because when we start developing uh, an IoT application, it's because we want to solve a real problem that we have. Sometimes it's even funny to do that but mainly it's because we want to solve a real problem that people have. So really understanding your data and give them a meaning is your goal while doing IoT application. Then if it's gonna be simple, easy, and eventually even fun, the better. Because we, want, we are gonna solve our problem and also enjoy solving it. So to give you an overview of the complexity, those are all the vendors in 2018 that have some solution around IoT world. And actually Arduino is, is one of the few ones that is here and also here. But as you can see, it's extremely fragmented um, landscape. So there are really too many vendors, too many protocols, too many languages, or even applications. It's extremely messy. So this is our idea, to make complexity simple to understand, because we are humans. It's fine if a machine learning system can speak with another machine learning system, but the main thing is that we are human beings and we need to understand our software. And we need to understand complexity and make it simple for everyone. And even the overall idea of the hardware in Arduino is made around the concept that if it is simple for novice people, then if you are a pro, it's gonna be extremely fast to use. It doesn't mean, so hiding the complexity doesn't mean that you can't do complex thing. It just means that it's going to be extremely simple to do if you know what you are doing. So we developed this kind of what we call it Panini concept. The idea is that you can create your own IoT application and hardware as if it is a sandwich. Why? Because, you know, to make great sandwiches, eventually everyone has the good uh, yeah, you, the good components, let's say. 
the, the stuff to make a sandwich. The real problem is the right recipe. So we try to use this analogy to say, look, you can have your own custom envelope and your antenna. Then you can have a career board that is like the foundation of in, to let your hardware interact with the external world. And then you have the real system that is making the computation, that is our uh, boards, basically. Then you decide if you want to add more capabilities, different sensors, or I don't, like GPS, if you want to different kind of communication like the Canvas or many others. And then you create your own product, which is your own sandwich. And then eventually, you can, after you created your own sandwich, you can sell your sandwich. So everyone knows how uh, a, a slice of cheese is done. What is really hard to do is make great sandwiches. So those are, you know, the slice of cheese that we have. We already spoke about them. But the idea is that each of them has a different flavor, OK? So you can either use GSM, narrowband IoT, or LoRa. We really doesn't matter. It's up to you, because some uh, love spicy food and some others don't. It's OK. So pick your best one and just stick to it. Then I can add more pepper or salt or whatever it is. So I can add more features to my sandwich. And those are the new shield we, we just announced. And finally, I can glue them together with some mayonnaise <laughs> or ketchup and add them on top of a carrier board. It's like the salad in the sandwich that glues everything together. And then I can start eating it. Eating it, it means that I can buy even a sandwich made by someone else because I just like it. This is one of our sandwiches. <laughs> it's a LoRa gateway. You can see how it is uh, it's being used actually out there uh, in the official event by a company making tractors. So they really made a real application to uh, control and also gather data from tractors in the field and then send them via LoRa and the LoRa gateway to our servers for further analysis. So this can literally save human life because if something happened to the driver and it's going to go to you know, not in the right path, we can have an alert system and stop the tractor whenever it is. This is extremely powerful, but also, you know, enables really saving life, but that means, more in general, solving real life problems. So it's not just about being passionate about uh, electronics or programming, it's about solving real world problems. Now I'm going to introduce our idea around the IoT application, because we have seen the hardware, and Arduino is in the hardware field, I think, already in the last 12 years, maybe even a little more. And now we are going to enable the next phase with IoT. Our idea is that you take a lot of paninis, <laughs> of sandwiches, and then you make them available to people remotely. This is really hard in analogy, you know, it's like shipping paninis somewhere else. <laughs> but, um, so I, I'm gonna stop the analogy, but the idea is that you can really serve those sandwiches everywhere in the world and then understand what your user are, are doing with the, with the sandwiches and also allow them to create something that is much more powerful than just eating something. But in general, to create something like this is extremely complex. It took us more than two years to make it properly, and we still have to you know, improve it. But now you have all the components. You have the hardware. You eventually have uh, edge Linux devices. 
then, then are gonna speak to our own cloud that can also speak to other clouds. So if you have your own cloud or you are using third party clouds, it's perfectly fine for us, even better, I would say. Why? Because obviously the history of Arduino comes more on the left side of this slide, no? So you know Arduino made a lot of uh, hardware, but also firmware development, as we have just seen in the Massimo's presentation. We are able to automatically generate the code for you, but obviously your business logic, you are the one really solving the problem. It's not us. And then the real challenge is to make everything secure because it's extremely easy to connect something to the internet. The problem is as soon as you do that, someone else is gonna spy it. <coughs> so we want, that, we want an easy way to make it properly without making it too much complex. Also, the idea is to let you manage your IoT devices, which is another challenge. Then we are gonna create a, an interface for you automatically and to automatically let you communicate with other uh, boards. Why? Because Arduino doesn't make money on top of your data because you know why? It's your data, not our data, okay? So we don't even know what you are transmitting. Our real uh, reason of existence is to help you solve your problem. We don't want to resell your data to someone else. To be a little more in, uh, in detail, as I said, we have the Arduino hardware. We found a way to automatically create a proper certificate and encryption keys. Then there is an automatic generation of your code. You can change your business logic. Then you can upload your firmware on your device. Obviously, in the future, we are going to also support over-the-air updates. And then we want that all of those are going to be automatically connected with our cloud, and we create an interface for you. So from now on, Gianluca is going to give you much more detail on this new platform. Thank you for now. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about the out of the box experience that we are actually trying to implement and include in all our products. So Arduino has in mind to make it as simple as possible, also for non-IT people, as you know, to make it like to have the experience that doesn't require IT skills. So we want to make it in a way that it's the simplest possible way for humans. Now, when it comes to managing edge Linux devices, I'm not sure everybody's aware that we have a device manager within our create platform, and you can also manage through our Arduino connector a lot of Linux machines. So you just install the connector on your Linux machine, and then you get it started. So you get BeagleBone, Raspberry Pi, up from Intel, so you can run Arduino code also on non-Arduino boards, so on, straight on your device. Now, when we talk about clouds, we're usually familiar with clouds where you host stuff. In our concept, we change slightly the idea behind it. So why don't we do bi-directional interaction with the sensors or with the devices? Now, let me, let me get it straight. To make it happen, we also wanted to make sure, following our philosophy, that we don't lock in the customers, so we don't lock in the users. So we develop an open IoT protocol on top of all existing protocols. We don't mind if you use co-op, if you use MQTT, if you use HTTP, none of them. So you can use them all, you can use the one you wanna know, and then we will translate the payload, so the traffic going through in our way. Then the application protocol, again, we're using on top of CNML and the flexibility. We do want you to focus on the logic, not the underlying platform and application. Now, imagine a greenhouse. A greenhouse is made of a fan that controls a humidity sensors, a light sensor or a light physical device, a light bulb, and the moisture for getting the humidity and so on. So now, this is how Arduino IoT Cloud looks like. So you've got to define the property, so let's say fan, 
the type of the property, status, percentage, lumen, or float, then the way you want to interact with it, so getting an update, so getting the last value, or polling the data every second, and then you won't believe it, that's all. We will convert, so that's the usual Arduino code syntax, no? You're, you're probably familiar with it. So you define the variables, so the so-called properties within our cloud, the light, pressure, humidity, temp, UVA, UVB, and so on, and then just look at the function, so at the method up there, Arduino cloud update. That's where the magic happens. So we will translate everything you do locally and push it to the cloud with just one line. So that's, I think, what's extraordinary about this. Now, the same happened with actuators. So you can make callbacks, like I said, bi-directional interaction with the devices and the sensors. So you can manage actuators out of your cloud. Let me give you an example if this works. That's the demo effect. I think it got stuck. Dun, dun, dun. I'll probably need to go without slides. I think this broke somehow. I'm actually waiting for feedback down there. It's gone. That's okay. It happens all the time. So, <laughs> in the meantime, let me, let me get one message straight out of this. So, everything that you are listening today about, f maybe we're getting there, okay, so I will continue later on. So, about the data, we want you to make it in a way that you can display and analyze data and focus on your business and not the code, not the platform itself. So, just work on the logic, we will take care of the rest. Good, it works. Now, we are Arduino, so we, we, we like also to make it fancy. We don't want ugly dashboards, ugly widgets and so on. So we are actually making very easy to add new widgets within your thing, so within your objects, within your, like the greenhouse, you will see in a moment how the widgets look like. So also, imagine how cool it would be to be able to share your dashboard with other users. So just a link, some permissions, and share them in a secure way. And then, of course, mobile. Nobody usually cares about mobile, but we do. Now, this is how it looks like. So simple widgets, look at the fan, bidirectional actuators, off, on, humidity, just collects the data, light, light bulb, pressure, temperature, and so on. So that's the way we're gonna visualize the data for you. And actually, you can also interact from the dashboard back to your device. Now, as I said, we don't want to lock in. We don't want to make lock in in any sense. So we're actually also providing webhooks. Webhooks provide a simple way to interact between the Arduino cloud and commercial clouds, or let's say any kind of cloud or any kind of webhook potentially that you could work on. So you will see that this is a cool example that I want to show today. So we have a webhook defined, and that's going to be a webhook on Google. Now, you can imagine already, we have a set of properties. What can we want to do? So we want to push the data from our cloud to Google Spreadsheets. So you get the data, and then you can do fancy stuff out of Google, uh, Google Sheets. So you don't, want, you don't need us to do any graph on your behalf. You can do it on your own. So you own the data, you can extract the data, and then you can also interact in between our cloud and commercial or other clouds. Now, security, that's what I'm here today for. So, as you can imagine, the S in IoT stands for security. Long story short, usually there is no security in IoT. Now, we wanna make it straight in every layer we're actually working on. So hardware, software, data, and what I miss here, and I feel ashamed of this, is people. 
Now, security is about four key pillars in our mind. Device identity, understanding that the board is legitimate, so that there are no fake clients simulating the traffic or putting in the middle between the device and the traffic we're gonna send back and forth to us. Anti-tampering, make it in a way that nobody can alter the content of your, let me say, sensitive data or sensitive keys in that sense, and we will get there later on. Key management, so we generate, as we will see shortly, private keys, X509 certificates, so a private key and a public key, and we want to make sure that nobody can steal from you the private key. Um, actually, the anti-tampering, the way we use it for key management, makes it, makes it also very secure when it comes to physical attacks, so some sorts of physical attacks. And then, of course, like Luca mentioned, encrypted transport back and forth and data confidentiality. Now, all this magic happened because of this little piece of hardware. So that's a secure element from microchip that we use. Now, secure element open a broader set of opportunities that we are actually still exploring. At this given time, we heavily invested on putting on top of our MKR boards a security crypto chip, so the 508 and 608 from microchip, as I said, and we actually use it for three main things. The hardware-based key storage, so we store the keys securely, read-only, so we can't do anything but to read the public key, but we can't even read the private key. The hardware support, so we offload all the load, so the so-called, you've got CPU load, you've got all kind of loads. We do it in the cryptographic chip, so we do sign, verify, and key exchange in a faster way that would be otherwise, and then for generating random numbers securely. Now, usually these kind of things might come in the black box, so you people don't, don't know what's gonna be underlined. We wanted to change this paradigm. We actually released a library for the crypto chip. So if you go through these repos, they're on GitHub, they're the usual Arduino library formats. There is a library for the 508 and 608. That's the library we use to communicate back and forth with our chip. We had to do a tiny, lightweight, but powerful port of the SSL TLS stack. So we couldn't use OpenSSL straight on. We had to rely on something that made us this implementation available and fast. And we choose BRSSL. So that's also on a library available as usual. And then we got an MQTT client for sending back and forth messages. Now, when it comes to the encryption, um, we actually have to protect a couple of things. One is the transport. And for protecting the transport back and forth, we choose to rely upon industry standards such as TLS. Then we do have device authentication. If you are familiar with this kind of clouds and with this kind of devices, usually device authentication comes in the form of username and password, or if you're lucky, tokens. So we wanted to cover both. When you connect to Arduino cloud, you connect in a secure way with X509 certificates. So we do a provisioning that I will show shortly. Um, we actually just communicate with the crypto chip to get the keys and to interact and make the, sh the handshake happen. But we also wanted to make it possible for our MKR boards to work with commercial clouds. So starting a couple of weeks, we do also have JSON Web Token support some of the commercial clouds are still binded to, well actually not still, but they do like to work with JVT tokens, so we had to support it. And of course, we try to make sure that we use strong encryption. So elliptic curve on one end, and AAS, CMAC in the case of LoRa. So do message exchange in a secure way. Now, just to recap quickly, the amount of things I said this, morning, this afternoon. So, we focus on hardware-based security with a lot. We focus on device provisioning straight on. We focus on TLS certificates for authenticating and authorizing devices. And we want to make sure that your data and the data transfer underlying is secure and encrypted. Now, 
this will never work, I'll try. So the video should start. I'm gonna show you how we, I'm gonna show you quickly how to, how we do provision, that's very fast, but how do we provision a device on the Arduino cloud, so that's the provisioning guide. So you're gonna connect the key, define a board, then once you configure it, we're gonna burn the certificate and the private key on the crypto chip. Once it's set, I'm gonna be very fast. <laughs> <laughs> then you define a set of properties. In this case, it's a switch, so on off. But I want, to, I want you to show, and I will stop talking now, how easy is it? So you get pre-generated code on your browser, so you can define variables, you can edit the code, then it goes slow. Now, being on the cloud and being with Wi-Fi connectivity, for instance, we have a tab, a so-called secret tab, where you can define your Wi-Fi network or your company Wi-Fi network and the Wi-Fi password that will be saved securely on our cloud. Then you push the code on the board and then you can go back to the IoT cloud and you're done. So the usual way of coding within Arduino devices just with cloud capabilities. So look at this now. You've got this, and you see? That's where the magic happens. So really, it's gonna take you one minute. I invite you to give it a try tonight, if you have nothing better to do. <laughs> You're gonna love it, and we would really love to get feedbacks. I mean, we launched this a couple of weeks ago in open beta, and we would really like to collect feedback and make it better. If I can get back the slides. That's where it breaks. Anyway, I think the last slide was, thanks for attending this. And um, if you have any questions, me, Luca, and the whole team will be around the whole day. So I'll be happy to answer any question that you might have. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we also made tutorials available on our website. So if you go to Project Hub, now it works. So if you go on Project Hub, you get a getting started guide on how to use our Arduino cloud. You get how to connect with the AWS IoT Core and the Azure IoT Cloud. And also how to interact with webhooks like I showed before. And there's a new one that I couldn't announce today, but I can make an intro about. We're gonna also support Google starting next week. So you're gonna have a tutorial on how to interact between Arduino boards and the Google Cloud Core. That's really all. So thank you very much for this. Thank you everyone. And now our colleague Nerea is gonna tell us all the news and updates about the Arduino Education Program. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Luca. Hello, everybody. I am Nerea de la Riva, and I am the Arduino Education Portfolio Manager. As Fabio and Maximo were commenting before, education is really important for Arduino. So that's why today I want to share with you what is our vision of education and how do we share it with students and teachers from all around the world. Therefore, I think this is the last presentation of the day. So I will try to keep it short so you don't fall asleep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we are a global team of people fully dedicated to, to education inside of Arduino. And our goal is to put the educator in the center of the picture, making them understand and find ways to bring technology into the classroom. How do we do it? That's a different question. We all know that giving technologies and educators, uh, sorry, giving uh, educators and students the technology is not enough. There are many other things we have to do on top of that. So what is what we are doing instead? We are developing the content, the tools, and the materials that help the students to use this technology in the classroom. Moreover, we are, all, we are also training the educators so that they can feel comfortable when they are using technology in the classroom. 
And the way that we are doing it is by bringing close curriculum projects and programs that merge different subjects in order to make it, and to make it uh, engaging for the students so that they like it, that they enjoy when they are using it. I'll give you some examples. The first of them is this one here, where you are seeing this picture. It's actually the result of an experiment that we did in Spain some weeks ago. It's a group of students that they made their own satellites based on Arduino, and they launched them, and they measured different variables. So while doing this, they were learning about science, astrophysics, and of course, technology. But this is not the only example we have today. Many of you might know about our CTC program, or Creative Technologies in the Classroom 101 program. This has been the first educational program that we have in Arduino. And it has all comprehensive training and support for teachers. So we prepare them in advance. Now I want to go back. Ah. I need to go back. Ah, yes. <laughs> so we prepare them in advance. When they, when they uh, enter the program, we prepare them in advance. And then we support them when they are implementing the program in the classroom. All that is also supported for the online learning platform in which we allocate all the content that the students are going to be following. And we are also putting a lot of uh, our efforts and we strongly believe that what we really need to encourage is the group collaboration among the students. Because maybe the technology in, in that box will be obsolete in some years. But we want the students to keep knowing how to communicate and how to work with others in order to achieve the results, right? So this is the main message. Another thing that I really wanted to highlight is that the CTC program, just in 2018, so last year, it has been adopted for more, more than 35,000 students globally. And we have been training 3,000, even more than 3,000 teachers so that they can bring it and they feel comfortable using it. So that's, that's key. This program is being really, really successful for us. When coming to a different, sec we are different actually target or age group, Last year, during the Arduino Day, we launched our first program for the higher education community, which is called the Arduino Engineering Kit. And again, like all the educational programs we are creating, it's all about cross-curriculum. In this case, what we are merging are the different core engineering concepts into the same, in, into the same project so that they can interact with each other. In this case, it's all being done through three hands-on projects that the students are going to experiment by themselves, build, design, and play with it afterwards. We have co-developed it together with MathWorks. And just in less than a year, the Arduino Engineering Kit has been adopted for more than 130 academic institutions from 60 different countries. So we want to take the opportunity today to actually thank all the people in, and in specific all the students and all the teachers that trusted both Arduino and MathWorks when adopting, a, when adopting this uh, program, the engineering kit. So thank you very much. <laughs> And I think this is super cool. This is how people use it. This is how people bring it into the classroom and, and all that, right? But the question today is like, what do, what do we have this year? So what, what are you bringing new, right? So I want to give you a little bit of context. And in education, the most important month of the year is January. And that is because in January, there is an event that is called BET, that is celebrated in London, that is the biggest and the most important event globally for education. In that event, all the industry announced what is coming new and what are they are going to be using that year, right? So this year, of course, we were there and we were announcing three different things, three different initiatives that we also want to share with you today. The first one is the Science Kit Physics Lab. This is the first kit we have done for middle school. So we are targeting, again, with approach-based learning, uh, sorry, with a project-based learning approach and with the cross-curriculum methodology, we are approaching a younger audience and we are 
connecting all the content and making it align with NGSS and UK curriculum so that it can be integrated within the curricular classes. And the idea behind this kit is basically that they are going to be putting together some experiments as, and they are going to be able to read some, some variables, let's say, so temperature, light, different things, and they are going to see what is happening in the screen of their smartphone or tablet by using the Google Science Journal app. It is important we have actually developed this uh, program together with Google, and we are so happy to say that today is going to be all open for pre-order in our online store. So if you want to go check, it's open from today. And as you can see here, what we have done with this kit and what it makes it different from the others is that we have removed all the barrier with the electronics and the programming. They just open the box, they do some experiments, and they extract the conclusions right away. So it's like a super quick and easy way to get started, and they jump into the experiments right away. So this is one of the initiatives for the lower uh, age group that we have announced at BET this year. The other one is the CTC Go. This one is the answer of, and now I have done CTC one and one, or now I have done whatever you had before for a secondary school, what do I do next? So in secondary school, we have wider our portfolio. We have included CTC Go, which is the first multi-year flexible and modular approach to STEM classroom solutions. It is cross-curriculum, in case you <laughs> didn't know. It is, cur is cross-curriculum, and we are having 20 lessons in this case. It's also aligned with the NGSS and the UK curriculum and the 21st century skill, of course. And once again, we are including training and support for educators so that they can use it safely and comfortable in the classroom. And something that is interesting is that what it makes it different is that the modularity aspect. So, what you see there is the core module. That is the first step. That is the introduction. But that core module will be combined with multiple expansion packs about different topics, science, math, engineering, arts, robotics, IoT. It can be, there can be an expansion pack, an expansion, expansion pack for whatever it is interesting. And that combining with this is going to allow the teachers to create their own uh, educational they run a STEM educational journey into the classroom, and that will answer the, their need in the classroom. You need this, you create this and that. You need a different thing, then you can pick up this and a different expansion pack, and you create a different learning path. So it is flexible and modular for them to create it in the way they want. And the third thing that we announced, but not less important, is the Arduino certification program. So we have many, many users and many teachers asking us, like, how do I show or how can I prove that I'm actually proficient in Arduino? I want to test myself. So this is the answer. We have released the certification program for now, just the fundamentals part. The fundamental part is targeted to enthusiasts, educators, and professionals. And it is all about the theory behind the introduction to Arduino, the coding, and the electronics. And of course, since it is about the introduction, it is based on our Arduino starter kit. So these are the three different initiatives we launched. Sorry, we announced it at BET. And before leaving, I would like to, to uh, leave you with a couple of thoughts. The first one is that in Arduino education, we are fully convinced that education is not only about sending kids to school and expecting them to come back home already trained. It is not about that. It is about bringing the different stakeholders into the picture and make an integration between families, uh, governments, curriculum makers, schools, teachers. So it is about working all together in order to provide students with the best opportunities. And in fact, I'm really happy to say that most of our programs are the results of this. So for instance, CTC is the result of four years of collaboration with, with different um, academic institutions from all around the world. So we always try to do this when we are prototyping our new programs. And the second thing is that education is not only about kids. For example, Arduino is participating in a massive European project that is focused on educating the future manufacturing companies, workers, and owners. And finally, we, we have also identified, and we all know, that we never stop learning, or at least I do never stop learning. So we, we need to keep this in mind 
and we, are, we have identified this need of educating the non-digital adult people so they can actually develop the skills as needed to, to become part of the current job market because the job market changes super, super fast. And that is actually due to technology. So we, not, we need to catch up and we need to be able to, to help them with that part, right? So that's why from now on, as Arduino, we also have this main priority, which is going to be helping these non-digital adults. So it's going to be a priority, and we will be working with it in the coming years. And that being said, I just wanted to say thank you very much to all of you. I hope you had a good day, and thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. Good job. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So it's a wrap for this part of the streaming program. And um, we have just a few messages before we close. Uh, also a few dates and some uh, reminders. So one thing that's very important for me because I'm also... Uh, the curator, along with Mr. Alessandro Ranellucci over there. Woo! And uh, so the two of us are the curator of the Maker Fair in Rome, which I think it's either the first or the second largest in the world, if you look at in terms of people. We had almost 120,000 people last year. Uh, we have done a lot of work to really change, in a way, to match the, con the concept of Maker Faire, which is kind of like a big, kind of big celebration of makers, with also some connections with industry and Industry 4.0 for the people. And I think it's working out very well. So it's going to be between October 18 and 20 in Rome. Uh, very important, between April 3rd and July 1st, it's the call for makers. So if you have a project that you want to showcase at Maker Faire, you send it during this time frame in July. Me and Alessandro, mostly Alessandro, <laughs> Alessandro does all of the difficult part of the work. Um, and I'm very lucky to have him. Uh, as a co-curator. Um, we select the projects and then we basically give a space for free for people to come and show the project. Last year we had over 600 uh, makers showing their project. There are schools, there are universities. There's a, there is a pavilion the size of a football field which is just dedicated to activities for kids. We had, a f we had like even a, a fake uh, how do you say, a field where people were, you know, pretending to be growing food. We had drones, we had all sorts of crazy stuff. So make sure it's, it's the European Maker Faire, but there are people coming from all over the world. So for me, it's very important, and I'm, uh, you know, take, pre present your ideas. So we're also running this um, competition called the Ultimate Arduino Challenge. One of the, um, the main prizes is actually a trip to Italy. So clearly, if you're already in Italy, it's less exciting. But if you are from the other side of the world, uh, the idea that you, know, you can come, we'll show you the, 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 the factories that make the, uh, the Arduinos, and, um, and you'll get to see the Arduino, one of the Arduino offices in Torino. We have multiple offices. Uh, so you'll see the one in Torino. Uh, where you can enjoy the local foods and all that. And uh, so we are kindly sponsored by uh, Mauser and Microchip, and we're working with Supply Frame to make this happen. The, comp the competition goes on until July uh, 6. So check, there's a, there's a website. If you search for uh, Ultimate Arduino Challenge, you'll find a website where you can participate. It's already, the competition is already started with a lot of people proposing projects, so you have to get going. The competition is strong. So the recap, we are working at, we allocated $50,000 to give back to different open source initiatives. At the moment, we are using this logo just to indicate the concept of open source, but we'll work with different open source projects 
to give to give back and support, especially the open source project that we rely on, that we are there are our foundation, but also other uh, projects that you know the community will tell us which projects we need to support. I think it's very important for us. I wish that uh, you know every year we will be able to increase this number. Let's start with this and uh, let's let's go forward. And the slides could go forward. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for participating in person. Uh, thank you very much uh, for participating online in the 659 location around the world, which is a staggering number in 100 different places. We already decided uh, that next year, the Arduino Day is going to be on March 21st, which is very important because it's the first day of spring. But it's also the birthday of this lady in the first row. Ciao, Louise. <laughs> but we, we didn't pick because of the birthday. We are going to ruin your birthday next year. Fantastic. <laughs> no, but in a way, you know, it's uh, first day of spring. You know, it's a beautiful beginning of the season. And, uh, you know, we, we think that uh, next year there will, there will be more events, more people, larger community. So I can only say thank you very much. Oh, it's... yeah, and just I want just to thank also all the colleagues from uh, from the Arduino team and the different offices that did an extra extraordinary job to make this uh, this happen. Christina, Keith, and uh, all the graphical team, on the design team, and uh, the store team, everyone in the company, and uh, it's really a great pleasure. And also the kind volunteers who decided to participate and help us uh, run this thing. Because again, you know, we are very lucky because we are part of a huge community. So when we say, okay, we're doing a community event, can somebody, there's somebody who wants to help, we immediately get people saying, I want to help. And I think that's, an inc we are incredibly blessed for that. Yeah, and also the municipality of Milano. <laughs> we cannot forget, you know. <laughs> This is very, very important. They were, were very kind with us and allowed to use this fantastic location in the center of Milano and uh, help us organize all the, uh, all the activities and also Costantino. Yes, and we make our partner uh, uh, here in Milan. And the list of people that we should thank is very long. So please, dinner will be served here while we go through the list. Don't move. It's going to be about an hour. It's going to be OK. No, it's done. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye.
Siamo. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, this is an interesting experiment for Arduino. We've never done it before. So it's a ask me anything session. I'm going to be answering questions from uh, people who post uh, in a specific place on our forum. Um, yeah, it's a total experiment, but we would like to start this and maybe have other people inside Arduino in the future do a similar thing. And let's see how it goes. Let's see what questions we got. So we have a question from Adafruit about the libraries and which one are the libraries that are most uh, popular. So I'm going to be asking on the forum, but um, I'm going to be answering on the forum. But yeah, the, uh, today in the presentation, I actually uh, gave the first number. We didn't really collect those statistics until very recently. So let me see. Um, Aram, I limor, fail. So, yeah, I know that I need to speak, but uh, I'm also typing. And, uh, so, you know, this is the first time I'm doing this. So, so I'm typing the answer, but the general idea is uh, we didn't collect any statistics on uh, what libraries people use until now, uh, because also there were a lot of uh, concerns about uh, uh, people's uh, privacy and uh, doing all sorts of, you know, uh, understanding way too much about users. But we found a way uh, since January to track some of the information. So we published the first number today in the presentation. We're going to do a blog post uh, next week, hopefully with the numbers. And... Um, and these numbers are not perfect because we also, you know, that we have 800,000 people using the online IDE and there's a bunch of libraries that are used on that one that are not necessarily in this particular uh, statistic. So we'll have to improve the way we collect the data, but it is, uh, you know, it is good. It's very, very interesting. And the other thing, you know, there's a lot of uh, Adafruit libraries, so, you know, good job there. Um, there's a lot of libraries about different internet protocols and all that, so it's, it's, it's really, really good. Um, you know, hopefully uh, in the near future we can continuously publish that information so that people can kind of gather an idea of what uh, people are doing with Arduino. Uh, so yeah, let me finish responding to the question.
All right. Let's see. What's the next question? All right. So the next question comes from Paul, who is a, a big contributor to Arduino. Any idea when Arduino 1.9 might become a non-beta official release? Or as a sort of general philosophical question, how long should beta test periods be for a widely used open source project like Arduino? That's a very good question. We have to improve a lot uh, the way we do things. So I would say the answer is uh, hopefully around May during uh, uh, for a Maker Fair Bay area. But we would like to change the way we release the IDE so that there are specific dates during the year, hopefully quarterly, where there is like a release of the IDE. So there is a process where we freeze things, we beta test, we release, and we do this every every three, three, three months at least, or so every four times a year we have a release. Um, and let me type the answer. Typing without making mistakes is a major challenge of every AMA. All right, let's see. Other questions. The other question is from, oh yeah, it's a young woman called Beatrice who is 13 years old and she's a, <coughs> Arduino enthusiast and she was here at the event. It was very, very nice to meet her and her parents. Uh, she has a very simple yet very complicated question, which is uh, Massimo Banzi, my favorite genius maker. Thank you for the genius. It's probably uh, too much. Uh, in your opinion, what are the top qualities of a maker. I think this topic is relevant for young people like me. Okay, let's try to answer. It's a very difficult question. Um, mm, top five quality. I'll do my best. I wish I learned how to type fast, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's going to be slow. Uh, what are the five uh, qualities? Um, well, you know, I think um, I think you need to enjoy making. So the first the first thing is that you are a maker because you enjoy making. So because it's something that. Um, Enjoy making and and, and do it because um, making stuff is very is very satisfying. I think the second thing that I would say is that just keep making and don't uh, be. Don't be afraid about mistakes. So just keep doing things. If you make mistakes, you break things, just keep going. Don't stop. It's because the only way to learn is by making uh, afraid of making mistakes. 
the only way to improve is to keep making learning from mistakes and you know keep making learning from mistakes and uh, and move uh, forward uh, the third quality of a, this is a difficult question it's very philosophical i would say be be curious about curio curi i hope that people I hope there are no grammar Nazis at the moment uh, online because there are going to be a lot of grammar errors. So we have to be, you know, forgiving. Uh, English is probably my uh, second is my second language. Some nerds say, "Oh, English is my third language." The second language is C or something like that. But uh, that's too nerdy. I have a group of nerds that are off screen who only they can laugh at my nerdy jokes and then there's a group of non-nerds on the other side that don't laugh at the nerdy jokes so be curious about the world uh, across disciplines uh, meet people I think it's about go I think it's very important that that you meet people, understand different cultures, be curious about the world, but also it's important to cross disciplines. So you combine combine different different interests. The typing is difficult. Combine different interests. So just being interested in technology per se is not uh, is not very productive you have to use the understanding of technology as a tool as a creative tool combined with other things that you love and that way you really make an impact you use technology as a tool and combine it with all sorts of knowledge uh, with all sorts of knowledge to hope what's happening somebody's watching YouTube while I'm doing this thing eh? <laughs> I'm doing the work and somebody is watching some kind of tutorial on YouTube Okay, so I think the fourth thing is, uh, you know, uh, love people. Build communities, collaborate, collaborate with anybody, with, from, from any kind of background. I think it's very interesting, this idea that, you know, making, I don't think it's all about technology, anybody can do technology, but it's also, it's about working, this community aspect is also about coming in contact with people from different backgrounds, different cultures. Uh, you learn from people, uh, You learn from you learn a lot from other people. Also, because to me, very important this idea that uh, if you uh, get in touch with a lot of people from different cultures, you start to understand so much about the world that if you stay in your own little bubble, uh, you have such a limited view of the world. But if you go out and meet people you understand different cultures you can do amazing uh, you can do amazing things so the fifth fifth quality of a maker this is uh, difficult uh, I would say I 
I would say help others, make life simpler for other people. Some help others get where you are. Ideas, you know, in a way, sometimes people don't want to collaborate with other people because they think, oh, they're going to steal my idea, or whatever. But actually, the very important concept about this is that everybody have ideas. Anybody who's taken a shower in their life uh, had an idea at some point, no? Maybe even the people who don't take showers, but, you know, they, they have ideas. But then the, taking the ideas and making it happen is the only thing that counts. Because, you know, say, oh, the, the forums are full of people. Yeah, I thought about that. Yeah, okay, everybody thought about that. But then somebody woke up and made it happen. So it's important that... Uh, Okay, wow, that was a tough one. No, I don't want to. Uh, no, no, I want to post this. Ah, the forum, okay. Good, let's see what are the other questions. Da -da -da. Okay, is it possible to copy an Arduino program from the Arduino to the computer? Well, you can copy the binary file. Copy the compiled code, hex, but you can't easily rev uh, turn it, it back into the original code. It's okay. You can, if you rewrite, it's okay. If you rewrite it, it's going to be better than the original code. Let's see what are the other questions. Ta -ta Thomas, Thomas Amberg. Is, it, is there any chance of a feather compatible Arduino board? I don't know. We have our ecosystem uh, you know we develop that and uh, Adafruit develop theirs they are software compatible so you can pick and choose. Thomas is a very um, active member of the IoT community in Zurich. Ciao, Thomas. Let's see, other question. I'm looking to transform my Arduino project into a commercial prod. If I use an open source hardware and software, should I release also my project in open source? Okay, so this is going to be long to type, and I'm just going to ask uh, Jack, Jack Sock to Google it a little bit, but I'll do it uh, by voice. So effectively, if you use open source hardware and software, you can build commercial products. It's fine. The only, but clearly, if you start your hardware from the design of the Arduino board, since that is open source, you have to share 
the modification that you made to the original board. So if you start from our hardware, yes, you have to re release it. If you design your own board from scratch, you can do that. From the software point of view, the license in Arduino says that if you make modifications or improvement to the Arduino software, so the Arduino libraries, and all that, you have to release that. But the source code for your project, it's yours. So if you build a project for an Arduino food processor, the code that runs the food processor is yours. But if in the process you improve the serial library, you have to release that. No? So you only have to release the changes you make to what we release as open source. The rest is yours. Um, so I'm going to try to summarize that in a phrase, but it's very long. You can build commercial products with the open source uh, HW and SW. If you may the the code for your product is yours. Yours. If you make improvements or changes to the Arduino SW library, libraries, etc. you have to share only those. If you design your hardware from starting from a Arduino uh, board, from the files of an Arduino board, you will have to share the changes. If you design, design, ah, sorry, <laughs> typing is hell from scratch, you Okay. Boom. Okay, let's see. Other question. Okay, this is a super technical question. Hello, Massimo. A question on the Arduino IoT Cloud or better, the software that powers it. Do you have any plans, thoughts to release it for running in an edge computing scenario, prefer, pre preferably on my own bare metal? With the development of 5G connections, the idea of proximity and network security optimization will be a major goal for IoT solution architects. Thanks, Francesco. All right, so Francesco. Um, the, um, well, the short answer is yes, we are thinking about those scenarios. Actually, uh, we have a bunch of software in the Arduino IoT cloud that lets, lets you manage and run code on edge devices. I don't know if you even see there was a, there's a way to run Docker containers on edge devices. So there will be ways where you can run part of the infrastructure on an edge device, or, or you can use the open source code to build your own edge uh, solution. I will try to answer. There is a suggestion from the audience. Uh, yeah, if you want, we can do that. But at the moment, we are managing. Is that OK? Are we moving too slow? Or, uh? Yeah, okay. So somebody else will translate the tra transcribe the, the, the answer. Okay, so good. So then people are going to help me and this is great. Yeah, so the general idea is that, yeah, we are thinking about it. We already support a number of uh, edge scenarios on Intel and ARM machines. And there will be parts of the IoT solution that run on edge. Or you can even write your own, uh, you can also build your own edge platform 
based on, uh, uh, on our code. Let's see what's happening here. There are other questions. Oh, sugar, this question. Uh, there is a question that says, hi, Massimo, I have a question for you. What is the difference between a compatible Arduino board and a clone? Well, okay, there are a number of variations. It's not that simple. So what we call a clone, basically, uh, so there are different ways. So we release the, open, the Arduino files as open source. So no major uh, problems there. Uh, but you can take it and make your own board if you want to. So there are different ways you can do this. Some people take the design and they even copy the graphics and everything else. So they make a, a complete copy of the board. There is a counterfeit board and we don't want that. We don't want people to put the Arduino name on things that are not made by Arduino. So the general idea is that those counterfeits are really bad. Then there are clones. Clones, they just take the design of an Arduino board. They make it exactly like that. And they basically, most of 99% of the clones, they have zero, zero contribution back to the, to the Arduino ecosystem. They just make money by making a copy of Arduino cheaper. In my opinion, I mean, they are legal, quote unquote, but it's a pity that these companies are making a lot of money selling these copies of Arduino, but they don't contribute anything. They don't, bug, they don't fix bugs, they don't help with the IDE, they don't do anything, they just make money selling the hardware. A compatible board is a different story. So somebody takes our own hardware and makes a modification, generates a different product from it. So they add a little bit of their work to it. Sometimes they make modification to the software or something and they release it. So if they do this by also releasing the files following the open source process, it's fantastic. I'm very happy when that happens. Unfortunately, this happens rarely. A lot of people make versions of Arduino, but they don't release the files, violating the open source, and this is a bit of a pity. But there are a number of companies who make variation changes, types of, you know, of Arduino, and they release them as open source. And they also contribute back by writing libraries, uh, bug fixing, you know, doing different things. And also there are some interesting cases where you have boards there are a completely different hardware, but they have a compatible software. So you can use the software that you write for another Arduino on this board. I think one example between the many is the Tinsy board, because Paul does his own hardware. He sells it with his own brand and everything else. He adapts the Arduino software for that particular processor. And the nice thing about that is a huge contributor to Arduino. So he helps us debug, write the code and all of that. So in a way, his, um, his, his work is, is very, very interesting because he contributes a lot to the ecosystem by having his own product, which is completely independently designed. And I think that's a very, very nice model that uh, I would say people um, should, uh, should follow. So there's a other person that says, hi, Massimo, love your work. I'm a scout leader in Scotland and just wondered if you have any programs available we could use to get some free boards or kits for our beavers, cubs, scouts to learn with. Hmm. So we are trying to figure out if there's a way that we can support these kind of programs. It's not very easy because we get requests from all over the world and, you know, we are not uh, a billion dollar company, no? We are an open source uh, company. So effectively, I would encour encourage all the companies who make Arduino clones <laughs> to start giving away free boards to this kind of program. So at least contribute back by giving away free products to these things. So we select a few projects through the year that we support directly. But again, our budget is limited because we are at the end of the day, a small company and the ecosystem is big. Uh, the other question is, hi Massimo, is there any plan of supporting a dark theme in the Arduino IDE? So, uh, 
yeah, I think the short answer is yes, we support that on the uh, online IDE create. So we should be supporting it uh, also on uh, on the desktop IDE. It's one of the things that we need to do. And I hope that we can introduce that in the next uh, version of Arduino, the 1.9, which will come out at some point um, uh, in the spring. Uh, but in general, the ability to just uh, choose uh, a theme for the Arduino IDE is one of the things that we want to support. So let's see if there are other questions. Second page. Okay, so at the moment, there are no new questions which is very interesting Oof, there was a lot of typing before boom, boom, boom. yeah okay so while we wait for some other question uh, so they tell me there's a new question on the forum. Let's refresh. So why does Arduino still produce boards in Italy, not in China? Everyone produces in China, also Apple. Therefore, I don't think it's a matter of quality. Moreover, is it possible to know more about the Arduino manufacturing process? Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, well, you know, I think um, there's a number of there's a number of reasons. Um, it's it, I think it's interesting to manufacture in, in in Europe and specifically in Italy because um, some of the people who develop the hardware in Arduino are based very close to the factory, and having this relationship with the factories is very important. There's also any historical and kind of romantic uh, reasons behind it, because, you know, we started Arduino as a project near Ivrea. We started to work with factories near Ivrea to make the first prototypes. Uh, so it's, it's nice to know that there is probably about 100 something people in that area who are basically supported by the work that we do. And, and so mm, I think, yes, if we manufactured in China, we could probably make it slightly cheaper. But if you want to build things that are of high quality, it's not that China is dramatically cheaper. It's not dramatically cheaper. Even people more qualified than me, like Tim Cook, once they said that if you think that manufacturing in China is about price, uh, you haven't seen you know, how in a way, uh, how well paid are the top notch engineers and, and people in China. I think it's more about the fact that they have a very strong uh, supply chain ecosystem. So for complex products like an iPhone, you can get a lot of value, but you're working with high end companies. So there is a lot of manufacturing coming out of China, which is more kind of price oriented for products like Arduino. Sometimes they are using, let's say, cheaper parts that, you know, a company that manufactures an iPhone would never use. Their objective is to make the product cheaper. It's fine. There is no, no problem. But it's not the kind of manufacturing that we want. We like the idea that the board is robust. You can, you know, you can, uh, you can use it and uh, it will last for a long time. So I think, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I like uh, the idea of uh, manufacturing in Italy, but also the fact that the, the fact that the designers are near the factory enables this kind of back and forth and experimentation that leads to, to, better, uh, to, better, uh, to better products. The idea that you can take a file and randomly send it to a factory in China and it will come back as a fully finished working product is pure fiction. Let's see. Let's 
So Whoops. What happened? I clicked on the wrong button and I the forum disappeared from my screen. Okay. Um Let's see. I'm gonna. Ah, on YouTube. Yeah, okay. Yeah, don't worry. Just uh, you can tell me the question aloud. Yeah, so the question is about the at Mega 4809, which what it's the one that we use on the Arduino Uno Wi-Fi Rev2. Uh, so are we going to be using it in the future? Yes, the answer is yes, because it's an interesting board. It's an interesting processor, because effectively there is still uh, quite a large part of the Arduino community that wants to use 8-bit processors. Uh, but they need more memory, more, uh, more, uh, more features. So I think it's very interesting. The 4809 has a number of interesting features and more, more memory. So uh, the Uno Wi-Fi RF2 was just the beginning. We're now thinking about applying the same processor to a number of other uh, boards. Considering that now the team has done a fantastic job at building a library that basically every time you use an Arduino, uh, sort of old style Arduino code that runs only on the Arduino Uno, this library intercepts the calls that you make to, the, to those old registers and maps them to, the new, to the, new, the new product. So I think it's very cool. Uh, yeah. Right, so the so yeah, so you can see a lot of a number of new boards coming in the future. Um, question from Ramesh. Hi, Ramesh. Can I use Arduino Cloud with my own ESP8266 hardware? So okay, so um, the question is in the future, yes. So right now we focus a lot on the idea that the the connection with the Arduino Cloud needs to be super secure. So we put on all our products this crypto chip, it's an ECC 508608 from Atmel, that we use to make sure, Atmel microchip, that we use to make sure that the authentication is strong and hardware-based, uh, certificate-based, so there are no credentials in the code. So there's a bunch of features because we are using the cloud and the MKR boards in robust uh, applications for people that are actually building quite serious, uh, robust projects. L in a later phase, we are going to be enabling also other, any other board that can run Arduino code, uh, which will use a simple, uh, let's say, token, uh, let's say, API key so that you can, uh, you can connect uh, to, the, um, to the cloud without using uh, with, with just a generic Arduino compatible hardware. But it's going to take a little bit of time and also we'll have to explain to people that yes, you can use it, but it's not as secure as the other solutions. Um, what about the new command line interface ID? Well, yeah, so if you go to um, GitHub and you search for Arduino-CLI, Arduino CLI, basically uh, our team built this fantastic piece of code, which is a single binary file. It's one binary file that basically 
does almost all of the things that the IDE does behind the scenes in one binary. So you can basically say Arduino new and you create a new project, then you assign the project to a certain board, and then you can say Arduino compile, Arduino upload. So you can do all things through this, uh, this interface. And so this is useful because some people want to automate procedures. Uh, I think it's, you can also install libraries in cores from the command line. Some people want to have their own IDE. There are some people who say, yeah, but I want to use, uh, you know, Vi as an editor or Emacs or whatever. So with this tool, they can just do that. The advantage compared to the other solutions that are out there is that this is just one single tiny binary file. So there is nothing to install. You copy the file, you run it, it's, that's it. It does all the rest of the work. And I think that's a huge thing. The guys is looking for tutorials. Tutorials for what? <laughs> it says, please provide some tutorials. Well, you know, Arduino has hundreds of tutorials online. Also, if you go to create.arduino.cc slash project hub, you will find several hundreds of tutorials built by people in the community. So a lot of, we also put them there, but you know, there's a huge amount from the community and people basically um, just write a ton of examples and code that's beautifully documented with pictures, code, even 3D files that you can print. So I think it's quite, um, uh, it's quite important to keep an eye on that particular, uh, particular uh, repository because it's very important. The presentation that we gave today, well, basically, I think all the streaming that all the things that you saw in streaming today were archived, so they will be probably available on our YouTube channel very, very soon. And uh, I think that's probably going to be uh, the best way to, to, to view this uh, again. And also, I think this uh, thing will be also available on uh, automatically archived by YouTube uh, as soon as we are done in about 15 minutes. There's a lot of very nice uh, love, uh, <laughs> love messages for Arduino. Wait. Uh, sorry. Here in my city was basically an event for beginners and in Milan they have this thing disappointing. Samuel, you know, every Arduino community around the world decides how to set up their own event. And that's, I think, the beauty of having 659 events around the world. I'm sorry you were disappointed by that specific Arduino event. We have this official Arduino event, around, uh, Arduino Day event around the world. This year was in Milan. Next year is going to be somewhere else in the world. If you tell us where you are, maybe we, we come to your city. Is Arduino running on RISC V and what do you think about this uh, architecture? Uh, so there are a number of projects uh, that have versions of Arduino running on top of a RISC V architecture. I think there's a quite nice project done by a uh, university in Croatia that does that, which is pluggable into the Arduino IDE. Um, and uh, also, we have a board that we released called the Arduino Vidor uh, uh, 4000, which has an FPGA on it. And then on that particular platform, you can actually import and run a RISC uh, five core, so you will be able to basically simulate a, a processor in that FPGA. So technically, using that and this uh, uh, port of Arduino, uh, you can use RISC V. I think the architecture is quite uh, interesting. I'm a big proponent of open source uh, hardware, so I think it's very interesting. The only thing that we have to be very careful about is that uh, RISC V by itself is not enough. So the, 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 the part of the processor which just interprets the instruction, usually it's a small part of the overall processor. The, in order to build a functioning processor, you need peripherals, uh, you need uh, all the other parts that make the whole 
uh, processor and they need to be properly designed because you know uh, uh, they need to be uh, they need to manage power efficiently so i think one of the issues that i see now is that there is a lot of work being done in that area but you know my, my objective is to make life simple for my user so right now I observe that a lot. I think it's an interesting area for experimentation, but we are, at the moment, we're not doing too much uh, with it, but we want to give people the way, uh, a way to experiment, and that's why we made this, uh, this uh, FPGA platform. One of the many, many use cases was, you know, build your own RISC-V processor and play with it. Nice comments. You invented a great opportunity for everyone. Well, you know, it was a big effort of a community, but uh, it's, you know, the community gives strength to the, the work that we do. All right, let me double check on the forum. Uh, yeah, we just got a new message on the forum. Yeah. So. The user Rubzir says, Hi, do you plan to release boards with remote download using BT or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi? When building robots, for example, you would like to change the software from the distance. So, okay, this is an interesting question. Uh, we do have work happening now uh, to implement what we call OTA, over-the-air updates through Wi-Fi on the MKR 1010 and possibly on the um, make, make MKR 1010, the uh, MKR uh, VIDOR, and also maybe on the UNO Wi-Fi Rev2. Uh, so we have code that we've been working on. There are also some open source projects about that. So we're trying to build that. And there's also some work that we are trying to figure out for uh, Bluetooth. Um, so, but uh, I think probably the first one will be remotely updating code through Wi-Fi from the Arduino cloud, and that's something that we are working on. There's a question on, uh, um, oh yeah, is, go, is Arduino going to embed embedded AI? Uh, yes, well, yes and no. So I have, the, the last year, and a half actually, I've been working on a number of scenarios of using some small scale AI on Arduino hardware. I did a couple of classes with my students about that. Uh, so we are experimenting. Uh, recently, uh, the, the TensorFlow team released a version of TensorFlow as an Arduino library, which runs on the Arduino Due and even on the Arduino MKR, which is a Cortex-M0. So it is technically possible to take that particular TensorFlow code and run it on an Arduino. If you look at Arduino so as a larger ecosystem, for example, there is, there is a number of projects where you can basically uh, take code written in using TensorFlow or other libraries and compile it as code that can run on an Arduino compatible hardware. So there is quite a bit of work done on STM32 at the moment. And, uh, but I would say uh, I'm personally very interested in understanding how we can make AI on the small scale very, very simple. Like, you know, blinking an LED in Arduino. It would be possible to do Arduino with a, uh, AT Sum 4. Um, so it depends what that means, because the Sum 4, I think there are some efforts that you can find on GitHub. There are, the, somebody was working on porting Arduino to the, uh, the Sum 4 S, I think. There is some work done uh, there. Um, we, have, we, we, we haven't released, uh, and I don't think we're planning to release uh, any uh, product with that processor yet, but it is available from the community. 
so it is possible to use it. I think there was a team of people in France who worked on it. We are good. Let's see. Okay, at the moment we are. Yeah, no, I just checked. At the moment it's. I think people are preferring YouTube a lot. I understand yeah. that, but uh, because they're watching the video. But you know, the forum is interesting because it's our home, no? So, also this is, a, this is an experiment. We have never done anything like this before. So we have to learn and, uh, you know, let me see what's going on here. There's an album that says, hello, we'll, we'll be an Arduino board with two processor with multi-core processor for real multi-threading. Sorry if I'm wrong. No, what's wrong? There are no wrong questions. Uh, so I think, well, actually there are already Arduino boards with multiple processors. For example, the Arduino Yun has a Linux processor on one side and a AVR processor on the other side and they cooperate all the time. Uh, there are different ways of using different real-time operating systems. Underneath the Arduino API, you can find libraries of people using uh, FreeRTOS, for example, as a real-time operating system with Arduino API on top. You can include it as a library. Uh, so the multi-threading is already there if you want to. Uh, a long time ago, we made a change in the Arduino API that allows people to basically build libraries that replace the delay function, which is the most blocking function in Arduino. So by replacing that particular function, you can then plug operating systems underneath the Arduino API. Uh, we are definitely looking at uh, interesting configurations because as the world of microcontroller progresses, we are starting to get to the situation where dual core, multi-core processors are starting to become uh, you know, very common. Even the ESP32 that we use as a Wi-Fi module is a dual core processor. So there are some interesting scenarios on how to partition code on different processors. And we actually did some experimental work when we were developing the Arduino Treboard, which was a Cortex, it was an ARM running Linux and an AVR 8-bit to actually figure out how to write an Arduino sketch which when compiled would basically split and a part would be running on Linux and a part would be running on uh, AVR. So there's a bunch of things that we played around with and I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. Ah, good luck. Guys, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Electo 101. There's a ciao from Tuscany. Ciao, Tuscany. My grandmother was from Tuscany, so I am partially from Tuscany. Just thank you. Ah, Luis Navarro, thank you. No worries. Uh, thank you for the question. Somebody says, I love Arduino, go to Germany. I go to Germany all the time. I love Germany. How can you not love Europe and Germany? So I was in Nuremberg just a few weeks ago. And um, yeah. I don't go to Berlin that much. That's a bit of a... There was a... Let me see. Na, 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 na. Let me see. There was... I wanna... Somebody asks, sorry, what projects can be done with Arduino? Which is a bit like saying, what kind of poetry can you write with the alphabet? You can write anything you want. Bruno Bruni says, do you answer also in Italian? No, because this Ask Me Anything is for the whole world. So we're going to be doing it only in English. Maybe in the future I'll do an Ask Me Anything in Italian. I have asked my friend David Quartieres to do an Ask Me Anything in Spanish, because it is the second or third, I don't know, most popular language, in, probably second most popular language in the world after Chinese. I wish I knew Chinese to do an Ask Me Anything in Chinese, but that's... Uh, I'm, 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 I try to learn a little bit, but it's too hard. Okay. Are we good? Oh, we, are we done? It's yeah. already... So, oh, wow. So, uh, thank you very much. This was an interesting experiment. Uh, I think we probably... 
have to do more of this. Once is not enough. But I do understand that uh, this is interesting in the context of um, of, of uh, doing live video streams, which is something that we want to do more. So my friend David Quartieres does a regular live stream. And also with my uh, friend Dominic, we did all these uh, video uh, video streams, webinar, web, I hate the word webinar. Can we not mm -hmm. use, Nelson? let's let's ban the word webinar from the world. So we did these live streams. Uh, where uh, mostly Dom discussed the professional use of Arduino with the MKR boards. And there was uh, quite a few people and there was a bit of a conversation. So I think a lot of the conversation has to happen, happen like this. So thank you very much for taking the time. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we'll do this uh, soon again. Thank you and good night. Good. Okay. Interessante. Wow. <laughs>